Welcome to Her Remarkable History. Remember, to support our channel, please subscribe. The painful death of Elizabeth of York, the first Tudor queen. The father and mother of the Tudor dynasty were Henry VII and Elizabeth of York. Their marriage ultimately ended the Wars of the Roses, the civil war that saw the House of York and the House of Lancaster at war for decades. When Henry VII agreed to marry Elizabeth of York, he was just seen as a rebel in many people's eyes, but he managed to defeat Richard III and then take the throne. Elizabeth married Henry after his coronation and the pair had four children who lived past infancy. But despite seemingly being enemies when they married, the pair were happily married and were known to be very devoted to each other. But on the 11th of February 1503, Elizabeth of York died whilst inside the Tower of London. In the following decades, at the orders of her son, two more queens would lose their lives in the Tower of London, the same place where his mother passed away. Elizabeth of York's passing plunged Henry VII into great depression and upset. In 1502, Elizabeth of York, despite being happily married and the mother of a number of children, fell pregnant again and was then forced into her confinement period. This occurred inside the Tower of London, which was at the time regarded as a royal palace and a residence, and not really a prison or a feared place. Her room inside the fortress was a beautiful one, and had been decorated with rich curtains and tapestries containing images of clouds, flowers and roses. On the 2nd of February 1503, she gave birth to a daughter, who she named Catherine after Catherine of Aragon the widow of her son, Arthur Tudor, and the future wife of her other son, Henry VIII. However, the child, a few days old, passed away from an illness. But nine days after giving birth, Elizabeth of York died from postpartum infection. Her death shattered the royal family. Her husband, the King of England, was destroyed by what happened. It was said that Elizabeth's death broke the heart of her husband and shattered him. Another source says how Henry VII privily departed to a solitary place and would no man should resort unto him. Elizabeth's death and the reaction from Henry VII shocked his closest attendants. The king, who was rarely a man of emotion except when he was very angry, was overwhelmed with grief. And this surprised his attendants and he was sobbing openly. Following Elizabeth's death, he shut himself away for a number of days and he refused to speak to anyone. Her death impacted him severely. Now following her death, the king became very ill himself and would not allow anyone but his mother, Margaret Beaufort, to care for him. He even dismissed doctors, but he did recover. The Tower of London was abandoned as a place of royal residence and because of it being a place where Elizabeth of York died, and following this, it became more of a site of imprisonment, especially during the reign of Henry VIII. After his wife's death, Henry VII became more miserable and was reluctant to spend money, and he lived a very basic life. But he did organise a huge funeral for his wife. Two council members organised the funeral, his treasurer, the Earl of Surrey, and the controller of his household cell, Richard Guildford. The citizens of London also helped to contribute, and when she died, the bells of St Paul's Cathedral rang out and all the other churches across London rang their bells as well. Elizabeth's body was tended to in its chamber at the tower and was washed before it was then dressed in her estate robes and was laid out on her bed. Her children were then brought to see her body and they said their goodbyes. On the same day, her remains were embalmed by the sergeant of the chandlery. He was given many things to perform the job including cerecloth, balms, spices, sweet wine and a great amount of wax. Her body was washed with wine and rose water and rubbed with balm and perfumed spices. Following this, her body was wrapped in cerecloth and this had been broken down into strips and dipped into wax and then placed on her body. Her body was then enclosed in lead and was then marked with a lead epitaph containing her name. This lead case was then made of Hollywood and the coffin was covered in black velvet and marked with a cross of white damask. Elizabeth of York's coffin was then carried by people of the highest rank, and it was taken to the chapel of St Peter Ad Vincula within the walls of the Tower of London on the 12th of February. Her ladies and maids of honour followed the coffin and marched side by side and then stayed inside the chapel with the coffin. The chapel was lit by 500 tall candles, the windows being lined with black material, 
the coffin was placed in front of the altar, and Elizabeth's sister Catherine, the Countess of Devon, took her place by Elizabeth's body, and she stayed whilst Mass was being celebrated. She then went away, and the coffin remained in state where six ladies kept a vigil. Catherine was the Queen's chief mourner, and Mass was said for three days straight. At night, the Lord's Prayer was said, and the coffin remained in the chapel until the day of the funeral procession on the 22nd of February. Her coffin was placed on a carriage at noon and then was taken out of the Tower of London. The cart was lined with black velvet and blue cloth and a lifelike effigy was placed above her coffin and it was closed in the robes of the estate of a queen and it had a crown on her head. Her hair flowed down to her shoulders and she had a, a spectre in her right hand. Her fingers had gold rings on them and the procession travelled towards Westminster Abbey, the place of her coronation. Many of London's people witnessed the procession, and many wept for their queen. Two hundred poor people carried torches and were dressed in black cloth, and this had been paid for by the king himself. Behind them were a number of the queen's household and the mayor of London, and six horses drew their carriage on its final journey. Behind Elizabeth's carriage, eight black horses with her ladies of honour rode, and each was led by a man in a black gown. These included the Queen's four sisters, and other noble women were in the carriages. Many guilds provided mourning clothes, and some dressed in white and stood holding torches in respect. The Lady Mayoress of London arranged for 37 virgins, one for each of Elizabeth's life, to hold burning tapers and to stand in Cheapside out of respect. These women wore white linen and had wreaths on their heads. More torches were given by parish churches, and all the city's churches were draped in black. As the cortege went past a church, a bell would ring. There were many European ambassadors who attended the funeral, and along the route were 500 torches carried by citizens. As it made its way through to St Margaret's churchyard, bishops greeted it. The coffin and effigy were then placed onto a hearse which had black cloth of gold and her motto, humble and reverent in gold written on it. Banners were draped in the corners of the coffin and there were other emblems of the Tudor queenship displayed including a portcullis and gold roses. The coffin then spent the night at Westminster Abbey surrounded by torchbearers and other observers and as the coffin lay in state that evening her sister Catherine presided over a supper of fish inside of the Queen's chambers at Westminster. During the dinner nights, heralds and squires kept a close vigil over the body all night, and over 1,000 candles burned. On the final day of the funeral in the morning, candles around the coffin burnt whilst the black cloth hung from the roof. There were a number of masses said, and the Bishop of Lincoln gave the final requiem mass. Women were then led to offer their final goodbyes to Elizabeth's body, and they presented a number of offerings to her. After the sermons, the pal and cloth that were draped over the coffin were taken off, and then the final interment was made. The effigy of Elizabeth was taken from the coffin, and the Bishop of London blessed the grave before the coffin was lowered. Elizabeth Chamberlain and her gentlemen ushers broke their staves of office and threw them into the grave. As the creation of the Tudor tomb for Henry VII had just begun in the Lady Chapel extension of Westminster Abbey, Elizabeth was buried in a vault specifically made for her in the crossing of the abbey between the choir and the high altar. She was then reinterred in a beautiful new tomb following the death of her husband Henry VII in 1509. Henry VII, despite being a tight man who rarely spent much money, spent lavishly on the funeral of his queen. He spent five times more money on Elizabeth's funeral than he did for his son Arthur, and spent, in today's money, around one and a half million on burying his wife. The funeral was a huge ceremony that allowed for a memorable spectacle to occur, and with this all of London joined in. The nobility and the poor all came together to pay tribute to the Queen of England. Elizabeth of York is remembered as the loyal wife of Henry VII, whose marriage ended a civil war. Her death was incredibly tragic and sad, and she was the first queen to die inside of the Tower of London. Later, Anne Boleyn, Catherine Howard and Lady Jane Grey would all die inside of the Tower of London. But Elizabeth of York is remembered as the matriarch of the Tudor dynasty, but her passing was very sad. Thank you for watching, and to support, please subscribe to Her Remarkable History. Thank you.